Yeah, so welcome to second week. Uh, we were off last week with Mother's Day, a uh, bunch of people out. So hopefully we'll get a good rhythm going here. Um, we're on to chapter two, which basically gave a, in my view, an overview of um, the ways to describe different kinds of models, um, different uh, approaches, and kind of what are the meaningful ways they vary from, from each other. Um, so the chapter talks a lot about uh, different vocabulary terms for prediction, for the different things that go into a model, um, evaluation. So talked a little bit about mean squared error and, um, and error rate for classification. Uh, the characteristic, uh, one way to describe models is parametric versus non-parametric. Um, so again, kind of that notion of uh, characteristics or dimensions of models. Um, uh, talking about model trade-offs. So I think this is a like, really important topic and I, I'm always like, uh, I think it's like a fundamental question when you're going to, to choose a model, you know, and you have a particular problem, like depending on what you wanna get out of it and how accurate or flexible it needs to be and what questions you're trying to answer, you know, like this is a really important, I feel like a really important point in the modeling process. And um, I really like the, their discussion of this. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, talk a little bit about supervised and unsupervised learning, which we covered really briefly last week. Um, talk about the difference in some of the different types of algorithms comparing regression and classification problems. Um, talk about accuracy for each type, the bias and, bias and variance trade-offs, um, which uh, I think is a really important concept for the rest of the book as well. Um, this leads right into overfitting. So discussing overfitting, um, you can talk about it overfitting in terms of bias and variance. Uh, talk about, um, just kind of be familiar with this K-nearest neighbors uh, classification model. And then the tuning, the role of tuning and uh, machine learning. Um, but uh, as always, feel free to stop me and ask questions and interrupt just by talking whenever. Um, all right, but I'll just start going through this. So, um, so yeah, so the first part was kind of asking the question of what statistical learning is. Uh, they're using this example of, um, Let's see of of uh, spending on different uh, modalities of like advertising, newspaper, radio, TV, predicting sales, um, and yeah, and it's an important practical problem because you want to know kind of where to allocate your money if you're in in advertising, and this could give you information about what gives you the biggest kind of bang for your buck, or at least the, the biggest you know association between the two. Um, and you can see in these three different uh, plots, um, there's different levels of kind of strength of association, um, as well as kind of, uh, so both the spread, you know, like the tightness of the data, as well as the, the slope of this, uh, these linear fits here. Um, yeah, so there's just kind of a motivating example to start to talk about one particular type of, um, of question you're trying to answer. Um, and so in this example, um, they talk about uh, input variables and output variables. So in this case, the input variables are the advertising budgets. So in this case, across newspaper, radio, and TV, and sales is an output. So in each case, you're trying to predict sales. Um, in this book, they typically talk about um, predictors as, as X with a subscript, um, which denotes what variable you're talking about. So like X1 might be budget, TV budget, X2 the radio budget, X3 the newspaper budget. Um, and there's a lot of different terms for these uh, predictors or independent variables or features or just sometimes variables. Um, I think this is also varies across different fields. Uh, depending on when, whether you're 
um, you know, in uh, one industry or another or academic research or a particular area of academic research. I think people definitely use different terms for these and they all mean the same thing a lot of the time. Um, in the in this case, we are talking about an output variable and sales. Uh, people sometimes call this the response or the dependent variable. And usually they use the symbol Y to talk about this. Um, again, a few different types, a few different terms for this all mean the same thing. It's like the thing you're trying to predict. Um, okay. Um, and then there's a very general form that um, they talk about here. So basically you have a bunch of predictors. Those all kind of fold up into this X set of, uh, you know, um, variables or features and their input to some kind of a function. And then your job is to figure out, uh, you know, what function or what um, set of transformations need to happen to get the best estimate of Y based on those, um, those values of X, uh, the training data um, of X. And so it's gonna, so Y is gonna always be, so it's gonna be some function of, of those predictors plus an error term. Um, and they talk about this error term as like a random term, error term. Um, so it's completely like independent of X and has a mean of zero. Um, and uh, the an F is like the systematic like thing that you can predict that you can learn from the data, these patterns, these relationships between your predictors and your outcome um, that you can kind of model and understand and, and kind of tune your model around. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yep. Okay. So here you made a mention, um, we have an a random error term, um, which is epsilon uh, with a mean of zero. What does that mean? Mean of zero. Yeah. So that if you, if you, um, Basically, if if you uh, if you fit your model um, and you look at kind of what's left over, um, and you, you look at the errors, um, in general, it should be kind of symmetrical. So there should be some that are, you know, where you underpredict, some where you overpredict, and uh, but on average, the the mean of those errors is zero. Um, so yeah, if you've I think that's not always like, I think that's my understanding like that, like you can have situations where that's not true. Um, but then there's something kind of uh, wrong about your like modeling process from what I understand. Um, um, so what you mean is like, when we have the mean to be error of zero, and mm -hmm. meaning close to zero, right? So it means those yeah. errors are those errors are very minimal. Is that correct? So that when we take them in, it's zero. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So so um, they they are kind of symmetrical around zero. So um, yeah. So like and if um, yeah, and and I guess like if you're if they're um, if you're kind of constantly under predicting over predicting, like the mean isn't zero then there's probably like a different functional form that you can choose to better fit that, that data and kind of reduce, as we'll talk about later, like the bias um, uh, between the true underlying kind of function and the function you've cho chosen. Um, so like, I think this kind of assumes that you've chosen a functional form that's close to the true functional form. If, if you've done that, yeah. you'll, still, you'll still always have an error term that's left over that's just due to random variation plus uh, uh, some things that you can't, that you have not measured that are related to your outcome. Yeah, so my eyes are okay. like, when we, oh, oh, go on. Good, sorry. I was just trying to, um, so in an easier term, can we think of it as if the line of, best fit or if the mean is around 10 then errors can be minus 30 and plus 30 so then the average mm -hmm. will be can we think of it like that yeah i think so um there's okay. actually a plot right here that i think yeah. shows shows that so okay. like in some cases you know where you have this fit um this line here um you're 
you have some observations where you slightly underpredict, some where you slightly overpredict, some where they're uh, a slightly more of an overprediction. But kind of if you were to aggregate across all of those errors, um, they generally uh, they generally kind of cluster around zero, um, or they sense. their average is zero. Um, and if they don't, then there's more that you can do. Um, there's more you can do uh, from a uh, a functional like standpoint, um, you know, to like choose a more flexible function or right. But or, that's part of that trade off. Maybe you don't want to. You can accept that right. bias and, and for whatever reason. It depends on what you're trying to do, right? Right. I think that's right. the point. The bias variance trade off stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but I would yeah, say we'll, this way we'll that, that yeah. what you actually have here is a model. You're saying I have a model that y is equal to f of x plus some error term. So in my model, the error term is a zero mean uh, fixed variance error term. Now that may not be a that model is the model. It's, it's wrong, right? All models are wrong, right? As right, you right, say, right. right. So, but that in the model it's a zero error. He it may not fit the model. The model may not fit that well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like the assumption of many models. Yeah, like all models, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, all models have this error term. The systematic yep. error term. Yep. Um, all right. Yeah, and we'll get into the bias and vari variance discussion in a second. Um, but uh, cool. Um, so let's keep going through here. So, so yeah. So this, I think we just went over this, but basically, you know, showing your residuals for this, um, your prediction errors for each of these points and kind of some are a little bit further from the line some are close um but um yeah the idea is that like generally it's kind of random around a mean of zero those those errors random variation around around zero um okay um so they talk about two main reasons why you want to estimate this function uh, this functional form um and their their prediction and inference. Um, so, um, in the prediction context, you have a set of inputs, um, and you want to be able to predict uh, output or y. Um, and in this case, like you, the reason the reasoning that your model uses to arrive at that prediction isn't if it's, if it's purely prediction, it's not really important how it got there. Um, you're, you're concerned mainly about accuracy and performance of, of that model for unseen data. Um, and um, as we talked about a second ago, so the, the accuracy of, of those predictions uh, depend on two main quantities, so reducible error and irreducible error. So reducible error, uh, you can reduce the gap between your estimate and the true function by imply, applying um, improved methods. So like if the true, there's always like an assumed true uh, functional like relationship between your predictors and your outcome, you can reduce this, this error type of error by getting closer to that true function. Um, there also is an irreducible error uh, where either that it's related to something we can't measure. Um, so there's some variation in Y that's explained by some set of covariates, some predictors that you don't have in your data set or, um, and, and uh, just kind of random noise that, that is, um, you know, always gonna be there. Uh, and you can't do anything about it in terms of a different kind of function to estimate that outcome or, um, you know, a different kind of algorithm for that. Like it's, it's there, there's always going to be some unme unmeasured variation, some irreducible error that you can't get around and that's fine. Um, but it's also another reason why if you see a model that's like too good uh, that where you have like a, a extremely low error or a um, uh, a uh, you know r squared of that's really really high um, that you you probably did something wrong in the, in the process um, a lot of the time. 
Um, and uh, so the, uh, so I think this, it's interesting, this GIF is here. And uh, I think on this, like probably the simple explanation for why it's here is that it, this is, they're saying it's an error, um, uh, which is fine, but uh, and it's kind of, it's kind of funny, but um, uh, I actually don't think it's an error because that no one really touched it and they like, you know, they just didn't get it. Um, but regardless, I think it's interesting because like in baseball, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, I'm a big baseball fan and there's been a lot of uh, progress in prediction and like quantification of baseball skill uh, in the last like 15, 20 years. And uh, I think this like also illustrates that this irreducible error part where like you can get a good chunk of prediction in terms of how good of a season someone's going to have, you know, how productive they're going to be, how, how many runs they're going to score, et cetera, um, home runs they're going to hit, whatever, how good their fielding is going to be. But there's always going to be these cases where just because of random chance and some weird thing, like uh, this outcome happens and like, there's no way you could predict that. Right. And um, I think it gives some intuition to this idea of irreducible error. Um, all right. Anything else on that before we go? No, move on. All right. Um, so uh, inference. Um, so another main motivation for building a model like this, estimating F, is to uh, understand something about the relationships between, um, between your predictors and your outcome, your predictors and your response, kind of the strength of relationship. Um, sometimes people care about causal relationships, you know, what, what change in one predictor led to some kind of an outcome, um, impact of some kind of program that you're running, et cetera. Um, and it, like, it, how is the, what's the best functional form to approximate that relationship? Um, so in this case, they're saying, can the relationship between Y and a predictor be adequately sum summarized using a linear equation or is the relationship more complicated? So you kind of really care in this case about the, um, the value of like the coefficients in the model, um, the, uh, the type of function they're using to approximate that relationship, um, et cetera. Um, so in these cases with advertising, they're saying which media are associated with sales, which media generate the biggest boost in sales. So that would be like a more of a causal inference kind of problem. Um, or how large of an increase in sales is associated with a given increase in TV advertising. Um, so here, right, like you don't, you're not, you're not, you don't want a black box model because you wouldn't be able to answer any of those questions. You want something that's interpretable, something where you'll, you can, it'll output some sort of coefficients that you can look at and uh, try to answer these questions with um, that output. Okay, so there's different ways we can estimate this function um, of mapping those predictors to your outcome. Um, there's two broad kinds. Uh, one is parametric and one is non-parametric. Um, the big thing about parametric models is that you're making an assumption about what the function is, uh, like what the form is of that function that you're, um, that you're using in your model. So, you know, if you're thinking that it's, there's a linear relationship, you specify a model that's linear, and then your, your training process is estimating the coefficients for each of the terms in that linear model. Um, so it's only gonna be able to estimate a linear relationship and nothing else. It's, it's, you know, it's always gonna output a, a result that gives you some sort of linear mapping of those uh, uh, inputs to outputs. Um, but uh, they, as they say here, you know, the true underlying form often isn't linear. Um, and if, if, it's, if the true form is too far from linear, um, then, then you could have some really bad predictions or um, really a lot, really high bias, uh, as we'll talk about in a second. Um, if you have more flexible models, on the other hand, um, like 
something like splines or, or talk about it, I think in a couple of chapters um, or even like a polynomial uh, type model. Um, you can also lead to problems of overfitting the data. So you're learning things about the data that aren't actually related to the underlying data generating process or function. You're learning things about that particular data set that are actually just noise that are, it's like related to that irreducible uh, error. Okay. Um, so non-parametric methods are different. Uh, they don't, you don't upfront specify what that relationship is or functional form. Um, it actually, in that process of training, you're actually estimating, like choosing the right, basically you're choosing the right or the, the function that best, that leads to the best predictions. Um, and if you, if it's extremely flexible, right, you could pretty much estimate any function in a lot of these cases. Um, again, like we could, you could have really bad overfitting problems, especially with these non-parametric methods. Um, and another downside, as I mentioned here, is that you need a, a really large number of observations um, to really get kind of for the, for the function of the algorithm to figure out what the proper uh, functional relationship is. Um, so does that mean um, parameter, parametric uh flexible or non-flexible and non-parametric are flexible is that correct yeah i think that's generally true yeah um there are parametric models that are more or less flexible depending on um you know like if you have more terms or um uh like there there's 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 still like a spectrum of flexibility within each of those classes. Um, but yeah, I think in general, that's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. When we say the flexible, um, can you say a bit, when we say model is flexible, what does that mean again? Yeah. My understanding of that is that, um, that uh, it like, it can take on, I can kind of approximate a variety of, functions or, or patterns in the data, depending on what that training data or input data looks like. Um, so if kind of one, you know, data set has, um, let me go up. Um, uh, there's like one of these good graphs, but like a really flexible model will kind of, kind of look at the patterns in the data and kind of chase the data a little bit more. Um, and follow like the trends in that particular data set. Um, and a lax flexible, flexible model will make more assumptions about what that uh, underlying form is and it, and it won't be able to kind of uh, chase like individual kind of micro trends within the data, I guess. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining that, but... Um, that like it's more sensitive to the data that you're feeding in, I guess, um, in terms of the the parameters and the fun like the its ability to to model these fluctuations and nuances in the data. But anyone else can contribute there as well if uh, you have thoughts on that. Well, you probably all heard that quote by John von uh, Neumann, the father of computers, where right? he said with the uh, Four parameters, I can fit an elephant. With five, I can make, make him wiggle his trunk type thing. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. upward fitting. So yeah, with enough parameters, you can hit every single one of those points <laughs> with yeah. your line. Right, right. And you're, then you're definitely fitting the noise, which is not what you want. Yep. But you can do that with, I just want to add to that. The uh, parametric model can be very, very flexible as well. It can, you can have, you know, a high order polynomial and you can make it, you know, make it wiggle his trunk as it were with a polynomial as well or with parametric as well. But I agree with you that the parametric lean toward the non-flexible and the non-parametric tend to lean yeah. toward the flexible for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for adding that. Yeah, I, that's what I meant when like, like in each, within each of those classes, there's definitely a spectrum of yeah. flexibility or, or um, ability to learn those kind of smaller 
variations oh. and yeah there's a group there's a uh, graph right there that kind of there we go yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i actually added i added this in for this, for this that's a great that's a great graph um, yeah, yeah. yeah so what rona is saying like um the uh, simple linear uh, may not be quite flexible but what we have like quadratic um cubic can, they can be like flexible right they can try to fit uh, more complex relations is that correct yeah that's what yeah. i'm saying yeah yeah definitely it can you know you can be a little bit more squiggly um like uh yeah not just a simple constant uh align with the constant slope Um, so yeah, so I actually, yeah, I really like this graph. Um, uh, and it, gra it, it graphs these, these, a few different techniques on the scale, on the, on this kind of space of flexibility and interpretability. Um, so if you go all the way down here and you look at deep learning, right? Deep learning is like the most flexible method out there. Um, you can pretty much, you can approximate any function um, given enough data for uh, a deep uh, variety of different deep learning models. Um, and, uh, but it's very low in the interpretability level. So there are some techniques to kind of see inside the predictions and try to get at why it's arriving at certain predictions, but it's very hard. Um, you know, it's a ton of like um, weights and you know matrices and stuff and like it's really just difficult to look look at the output or look at the model and figure out how it how it got from these inputs that you gave it to this prediction um but if you go all the way up in the upper left um you look at like lasso regression or um, just your basic like linear regression it gives you a set of interpretable coefficients uh they're they give you, um, you know, like you have a, some linear relationships and you know that independent of everything else, this, this term, this, this uh, variable, when it um, increases by two, you know, there's a, a 0.5 increase in the output or by one, there's a 0.5 increase in the output or whatever it is. Um, and you, you know, it's really more straightforward to be able to say something about inference, something about the relationships in that model. Um, and then there's a bunch in the middle. Uh, so it's really like kind of a, a spectrum of, of flexibility and um, associated uh, interpretability. But I really like this because there are real trade-offs, right? Like they're, um, you know, they're, and I think in the later in this, in this guide and in the book, they talk about this idea of no free lunch, right? Like there's, there's going to be some benefits to models that are more flexible, but you're also losing something. And in this case, their point is you're losing interpretability. Uh, all right. So, um, and as we discussed last week, there are some problems where you have uh, some kind of a label or outcome that's that's measured and you're trying to predict it um, called the dependent variable. And there's other cases where you have no labels and this, these are unsupervised problems. Um, oftentimes you're looking at clusters or um, trying to find patterns that are like inherent in the data. Um, uh, yeah, um, to kind of, find groups and things like that. Um, all right. And then uh, different kinds of predictors or variables can be characterized as either quantitative or qualitative, which would be categorical. So variables with like levels or um, uh, yeah, it could be kind of a few levels, many levels, et cetera. Um, but uh, and quantitative variables take on numeric values. Um, they can be integers, they can be continuous, completely continuous, um, can take on any value. Um, and oftentimes for a lot of these models, you can use categorical data, but you have to transform it or recode it in some way. All right. So um, as I mentioned a second ago, right, they talk about this no free lunch idea. It really depends on what you're trying to do, what your data is, um, and what your questions are, what your goal is to figure out what model is going to be most appropriate. 
Um, selecting the model is pretty challenging, um, but one thing that's important, uh, I think kind of obviously, is, is the performance of the model, um, each model. And uh, you, you want it to generalize. You want it to be able to perform well on uh, kind of a different sample from that population of data that you're building the model on, or maybe even a future observation or future, you know, if you want to uh, predict like uh, future sales, right? You, you want it to do well on past data, but you also want it to do really well on that, um, you know, data a week, a month, whatever your time frame is, um, if it's a forecasting problem. So one way that is often, they often measure performance or error is uh, mean squared error. So it's um, the prediction error, you know, how far you are from that true value squared and then kind of added up and, and um, divided by the number of observations. So the average prediction, squared prediction error um, across your data. Um, and then this will like penalize really bad predictions a lot more because of the squaring. Um, and yeah, smaller error is a little bit less. Okay. Um, so when you're doing model building and this workflow, trying to get to a, a good model, um, a lot of the time you're splitting up or all the time you're splitting up your data to training and test set. Um, in the training data, you will estimate error as well. Um, and this is referred to as the training mean squared error. error. Um, but uh, what you really care about in the end is, is this unseen test data. Um, so um, the degrees of freedom is a way to describe the number of parameters or like coefficients or the flexibility of uh, of the model or of the curve that you're using that functional form um, and uh, pretty much all the time when you're looking at your training data and you're kind of fitting that function on your training data the more flexibility it has the lower the error is going to be because it's learning the exact kind of nuances and variation in that particular data set um, you're, you're building the model based on that data. So it's, if it's more flexible, you can, you're going to decrease error pretty much uh, every time in your training data. However, um, you, you're going to have to take that model and uh, apply it to test data. So you're just going to get the features for the test data set, not know what the outcome is, um, and get your predictions for your model. However, um, oftentimes, for the test data, um, there's kind of a sweet spot. So the, there's often improved performance with a little bit more flexibility. But when you research, reach a certain point, uh, that um, test error starts to go up again. Um, and that's called uh, overfitting. So you're, you're, getting, um, you're getting such a kind of sensitive and in this case right super squiggly model it's chasing this noise um and um and you're gonna you're gonna start to get really poor test predictions um so they kind of break down the mean squared error into a few different quantities or values um and i actually watched the previous cohorts uh uh presentation and there was someone in there, Raul, I think, who uh, derived this from uh, this earlier formula that we saw. Um, but um, you can uh, encourage you to check that out if you're interested. But but anyway, um, uh, this um, mean squared error it can be reduced into the uh, variance of your predictions for a particular observation, the bias plus the bias of those predictions. Um, and then uh, the variance of that kind of irreducible error. Um, okay. So um, when they talk about variance, uh, it's really kind of how different does your model um, perform or like what, how different are these uh, estimates on the test data um, depending on the different kinds of input that you give it. So 
if it's incredibly sensitive to different slight changes in your input, um, and it gives you kind of very different predictions on your test set, then that model has like high variance. Um, and bias on the other hand is like how close you are to that true functional form. Um, so if the true functional form is in this case is um, I think the black line here is the, they're doing like simulations and the true function they've chosen, I think it's this black line. Um, so in this case, if you choose a linear model, it's pretty far away from this um, more uh, line with more curvature. Um, and uh, and it exhibits a high amount of bias in that way because it's very far away from the true kind of functional relationship. Um, but the variance of that linear model is going to be very low because um, depending on you know if you give it a slightly different sample, new data, um, maybe there's a few you know observations down here, et cetera, um, it, it won't really change the the, the model that much because um, it's not going to have doesn't have enough flexibility to chase kind of these these points up here um, or you know at other points along the, the x-axis uh, in this case um, so uh, so what they're showing here is uh, they show you like this linear model the true relationship and um, and this more flexible model with more degrees of freedom. Um, and, uh, and each color here, uh, these squares on the right, um, corresponds to the different kind of model. So this one over here, this orange, is the, corresponds to the linear model. And these two lines are the training and the test set. So for the linear model in both the training and the test set, um, it offers worse predictions than the other two, right? It's like a high amount of bias. It's very far from the true function. Um, as you get more flexible, um, you're kind of at this, uh, it's hard to see, but this blue line, it's pretty close to the black one. Um, on You're gonna improve your mean squared error on both the training and the test as compared to the linear model. Um, and it's kind of a in the middle of the pack in terms of flexibility. And then when you look at this last um, kind of very high degree polynomial function, um, it will improve on the training set uh, because it's learning those nuances of the training data. But when you see, give it new data in the test set that it hasn't seen yet, it's actually going to be uh, much worse. It's kind of getting back to the performance of that linear model. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, it's like kind of surpassing, like going, it's too sensitive um, for the true, compared to the true kind of functional form in that case. Um, any, uh, any other points here or anything you wanted to discuss on this part? Uh, I think these graphs with simulations are really helpful uh, to get this bias variance idea. Okay. Um, so they show you another example here where, um, where the true function is actually pretty much linear. Um, and so the linear uh, approximation, um, this, this uh, kind of yellowish model um, over here, least flexible, actually performs pretty well on both the training and the test data. Um, if you, if you um, have a slightly more flexible model, so this, uh, this, this one that's kind of right next to it down here, not this super squiggly one, but this one right here, um, it, uh, it performs a little bit better. So it seems like it's able to model a little bit more of a curve, like maybe there's of a little bit of a um, slight, like, um, I don't know, exponential is the right word, but, um, you know, concave, I guess, like, action going on. Um, to be able to model that, it slightly improves the mean squared error, um, but not a huge improvement. Um, and then if you get to uh, this high order function, um, it 
again, it's able to really chase the training data, but it's a lot worse on the, on the test data. In that case, you definitely have overfit uh, the data. Okay, and this last one, um, the true relationship is, is highly nonlinear. Um, you know, it has a, these kind of real um, uh, curvature um, and yeah, and um, it, it, that, those curves in this kind of um, form represents the true relationship um, between your predictors and your outcome. Um, and in this case, a linear model is, is terribly biased. It's, it's very far from that true functional form um, and it performs really poorly. And um, you need a relatively flexible model to be able to, to kind of model these, this, these curves, this um, kind of cubic relationship. Um, and it drastically improves the performance as you kind of uh, are able to do that. Um, and then, and then, yeah, and then you kind of slight again, start to get into a little bit more of an overfitting territory um, where it the kind of variance starts to uh, take over and knock out any benefits you get from um, kind of a tighter fit. So they talk about it. So in each of these examples, um, because they know it's simulated data, they know the true underlying kind of form. Um, they're also showing you uh, the uh, measuring bias variance and the mean squared error and showing you how they kind of relate to each other in each of those cases. Um, so uh, like, it's always a trade-off between the two. Um, in some cases, as a, flexibility increases, um, you, you get, uh, you, you kind of get huge gains in reduction in bias up front, right? You're getting a lot closer to the functional form. Um, but uh, at a certain point, um, variance really explodes. So you start to chase kind of the uh, irreducible error, the noise in each of these data sets that doesn't, tell you anything about the true underlying form, but um, it really kind of confuses the model in a lot of ways if it's too flexible. Um, so there's a sweet spot, uh, you know, at least in this first example, right, where you get um, kind of an optimal, um, you're at the bottom of this mean squared error kind of curve. In a lot of cases, you do see this U-shape uh, behavior. Um, in the second example, uh, so it was, let's see, this one, um, you, uh, uh, the relationship is very linear. Um, so you don't really get that much of a benefit in terms of bias, right? You're pretty close to the true form right off the bat. Um, and as you get more flexible, again, variance starts to explode. Um, and your, your mean squared error on your test set is going to be really high because if you're way up here uh, in terms of flexibility. Um, because the, you know, it's, it's kind of fitting patterns that, that aren't meaningful uh, for the true data generating process. Um, and then the last case, very nonlinear example, um, your, uh, you get some huge benefits in both bias and variance, uh, or, or may, sorry, mainly uh, bias um, as you, you uh, at, give it more flexibility, um, and the mean squared error, you know, drops by a lot as a result of reducing that bias, right? Which is um, one component of this mean squared error uh, term. And then, uh, and yeah, and then, kind of, you kind of have diminishing returns, and then, and then, uh, too much flexibility again the variance starts to really increase by a lot. So ideally you want to find a method and kind of parameters where um, both the bias, the bias and the variance are as low as they can be resulting in um, a lower uh, mean squared error on your test data. Okay, 
Uh, that was a lot of me talking. Anything, any comments or questions about that stuff? I think it's pretty important uh, for the rest of the book. So I hope I did a decent job of talking through it. Um, You're doing a great job, Kevin. Oh, thanks. Just taking notes, so I'm very quiet. But okay, cool, yes. cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting, like, bias, bias, bias variance trade-off is something I've, like, kind of uh, been exposed to a bunch, but um, haven't really been able to explain it very well. Um, I feel like I understood it in, like, an intuitive level, but I think this chapter does a really good job of um, giving concrete meaning a difference between those two terms and examples where, um, you know, they they're very divergent from each other or where one is really kind of the thing that you can reduce by a lot. Like, you can, you really get at like in highly nonlinear example, you can really do a lot to reduce bias, but um, uh, pretty much in all cases, as you get, it, there's a certain point where, where it's too sensitive, it's, it's chasing too much that irreducible error and, and your test set and, um, you know, the variance starts to really can, um, take a chunk out of your, your performance. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, can you come a little bit um, in the book, um, Calvin, they said um, the flexible models or method, they have high variance. What does that mean? So if uh, we have flexible models or method, they have high variance. Can you um, explain that again, please? Yeah. Um, so how they describe it is that given different inputs, so like, you know, imagine that you have a true population, a set of, um, uh, you know, a population of people or observations or whatever. And each time you're um, training a model, you're taking a sample from that population. Um, high variance is like given different samples and slight differences in your input, you're going to get uh, different kinds of output. So um, a highly uh, model with high variance will be extra sensitive to the input. So if, you know, and um, in these highly flexible models, right, you can chase kind of this noise here, right? So um, the noise could be like, because it's kind of like random, right? It could be one side of the line or the other, like uh, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. And a highly flexible model is going to exhibit a lot of variance because depending on where that uh, that sa uh, random sampling process okay. um, ends up in the sample that you've chosen, okay. uh, it's going to produce different uh, predictions because it's like highly sensitive to uh, to the data set that you're looking yeah. at. So this means like if assume we don't have flexible model like just linear uh, relationship, uh, yeah, the it won't it may have the same pattern with the previous data set because it is not weekly right because it's just like straight line or some stuff like that but the flexible model will try to fit all those points and it will give a better uh, representation different representation than the previous is that correct yeah exactly exactly i think that yeah i think you've described it well yeah okay thank you um yeah and and in some cases um there is truly a nonlinear relationship that you want to fit and you want a flexible enough model to fit it and in those cases, a linear model will still exhibit very low variance. It's not going to change much from sample to sample, um, but it'll be highly biased because it's going to be very far away from that true nonlinear relationship. And so you're going to get a huge amount of error, not from variance, but from bias. Um, sorry, I just want to um, yeah. get us back. Um, so yeah, yeah. now I said, um, flexible models have high variance. So they do that mean they have low, um, uh, low bias. Yeah. Bias. Yeah. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Can you but talk about that? I think that's not, uh, so like, I think it's kind of, that is also kind of nonlinear. So like, um, in this case here, right. Um, uh, wait, hold on. Sorry. Um, so here, right, in this last example, um, your, uh, I, so I think it's possible to like, what I'm trying to say is I think it's possible to like reduce your bias and get like really close to that functional form. 
but then kind of surpass it and like become biased, but in the opposite direction. You know what I mean? Um, so like in this case, right? Like you can get flexible enough to approximate this relationship and this curve, but then you get too flexible. And I guess, I mean, maybe that's just variance. Um, I don't know, like, is that bias? Like, can you go in the other direction after you become too flexible? And is that, cause you're like, you're kind of biasing yourself. You're moving away from the functional form in terms of extra kind of squiggliness, you know? Um, but I don't know, maybe that point is hard to disassociate the- I think the, the way- The variance. Uh, uh, I think the way they define it is that the variance you can just measure by if you, in this case, since you have the true, true, uh, it's a simulated uh, model, right. right? You can calculate the 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 variance, right, by just refitting random data over and over again, and you'll find that that's very low for uh, right for the cases where you have a lot of parameters, but the bias will be very high, right? Wait, did I say that wrong? The bias will be low. Sorry, you'll find the variance will be very high in that case, but the bias will be as low as it can be, right? I guess that what I'm trying to say, let me try a different way. What you could do if you wanted to calculate this variance, right? Yeah. Is to, and this is what they say in the book, right? You can imagine just fitting uh, simulated data over and over again and looking at how far away it is from the truth, right? Which yeah. no noise, truth. Whatever is left over, you would call the bias, I guess. When you subtract out that, subtract out the original, the actual noise, and then whatever's left over is the bias. Mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. I kind of would look mm -hmm. at it. Because yeah. I can't think of any other way to actually measure the bias, even when you have the true model and, the, and you're simulating it, other than taking away the uh, the, the variance, uh, the uh, uh, the random variance, what is it, what is that called? Systematic variance, and then the uh, unsystematic variance, right? And then whatever's left over is this bias, I guess. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's how I was thinking of it anyway. In other words, that equation up there, you can calculate the first term. You can, yeah. if you had the true model, you can do the last term because you have the true model. I actually know that one already because it goes into your model. This middle thing is just whatever's left over from your model. Right, right, right. For your fit model, I mean, not the true model. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I'm trying to wrap my head around it, but I think, yeah. Um, Yeah, like, like, I think it's useful to say, how do they calculate these curves here? Yeah, that's then, what I was getting like, at. You yeah, don't really yeah. say, but that's how I think you, you could do it anyway. I think you can only get that, that bias term by subtracting the other two off. I don't think there's any direct way, I don't think. Maybe there is, but. Yeah, so it's like, take a, take a model of certain flexibility, do a bunch of resampling where you're doing train the test sets of a certain data set over and over again measure the mean squared error and measure what the variance is in, in those predictions from, from sample to sample, and then subtract out that variance from the mean squared error. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it does make sense. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, uh, like, kind of formulation of it, I think. At least helps me uh, understand how they may have come up with these graphs here. Um, yeah, something something that was confusing to me when I was reading this was, um, was why uh, I get it from the formula, like, up here, um, but why why uh, the train set can surpass this dotted line um, uh, hold on. uh, where they let me figure out where they define it. Um, uh, maybe they don't define it in these notes. Um, Okay, the variance of that irreducible error term, right. I guess because you're able to overfit and kind of chase the noise, even though it's not like systematic um, in the train set. Uh, so you're able to kind of like cross that uh, 
this dotted line. Uh, yeah, you go below the dotted line because you're fitting all the noise. So you're actually, you right. can fit it perfectly. You can get it all the way down to zero if you get enough parameters. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, so that's the dotted line. It's just this. Yeah. Um, right, so if, yeah, yeah. So if the reduction in bias is greater than this noise, then you can go below or, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I on, think the, I on the training set, on the training, yeah, the training set. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, it's actually five o'clock. Um, oh, yeah. So I didn't realize that. Um, so can we just talk for briefly about signups? So um, I'm hoping that we can get some signups in the next few weeks. Um, uh, I I am actually happy to to finish off this chapter and do the exercises because we do have the classification part um, that we haven't covered and then uh, go through these exercises. How about I'll do that? I'll put my name down for that. Um, but it'd be great if, um, so Lydia, I think was gonna do this one, but she can no longer do it. I can do that one, I'll put so, my okay. name. Awesome, Pranika, is that Pranika? Or? Yeah. Okay. Pranika. Awesome, thank you. Um, great. And um, yeah, so, so as you see kind of, these next few weeks lining up. Um, if you're gonna be able to be here and you're feeling like somewhat ready to present, I encourage you to put your name down. Um, and uh, and yeah, you don't have to know it perfectly or, you know, as I showed, you can have a lot of questions yourself <laughs> about what you read. So um, yeah, and just a note, I won't be here on the 5th, but um, I'll be traveling, um, but uh, I think it's the fifth. Let me double check my calendar. One of these two, I won't be here. Um, but I think we should still meet. Uh, uh, you know, whoever's presenting can present, um, and you can do a discussion. And you know, um, I think it's. I think it'll be fine. Uh, so, any any questions or anything? Um, we'll do. Yeah, we'll meet next week. Do part two and do the exercises. Um, just a. Um, a heads up. So when it, when we say exercises, it's these are, I guess at least in this case, it's not actually the lab part. The lab part has a lot of like, kind of base R, like how you do plotting, how you uh, import data, etc. Um, this is like the exercises and conceptual questions towards the end of the chapter. Um, so yeah, so I'll go over this, and but I encourage everyone to like take a look at that and then try to answer them yourself. Um, and then there's the answers that are listed here. Um, so. All right. Thanks Anything? for clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's always true though. Uh, like, it seems like the labs, the lab part are, is probably uh, more a part of the later chapters. So here they have like the actual lab. Well, there's nothing there. But, yeah, I, I think that it would seem like it gets more melded in terms of conceptual and the actual lab part once you get further into this. But since this was an introductory chapter, yeah, then the lab just seems very different than whatever the content is. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, like I think you're right that this case, like this is chapter five, and they're talking about cross validation. And there's actually exercises around cross validation. Um, but then this next chapter, it's just conceptual questions. So. So how in this uh, book thing, how book club, how are we doing this? The uh, the labs then? Are we gonna go through those parts or just leave those for the read? What's the plan on that? Like chapter three has a relatively large lab section, I noticed, and then exercises after that. Yeah, um, I I was assuming that we would go through the okay. lab um, if it if it's like a if it's about like the the topics that we've covered. Um, this week, it's just, it seems like a lot of saying is it seems like a lot of like, like how you plot things, how you- Yeah, like, this week's like basic R is what yeah, it is. Yeah. So I think this week we'll, uh, if it's okay with everyone, we'll just do the conceptual questions. Um, yeah, that sounds but good. Feel free to ask questions about the lab part in chat or you're even in the R for data science Slack. Like that's something I forgot to mention last time is that 
like this, the space is actually set up to answer any question pretty much about art. Um, so if you have other questions, you can ask it here in the Slack or for our community or for our book, book club, or you can ask it in other channels. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, but is that okay with everyone that we'll just do the, the conceptual questions next week and yes. finish up, yeah. finish up clustering, um, or sorry, K-Nearest Neighbors classification. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, sounds good. Um, I just have a question maybe that we can leave off for next week, but why is the var E in the equation that we were looking over, the bias and variance, equal to set to one? Why are those dashed lines set to one? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if anyone else knows why. No, they're, they're just, they just, the model is, remember, this is just simulated data. So for the model, they vary is just one. So for each one of those points, they, they yeah. had like, for example, the curve, they took the, they calculated the point on the curve, then they added a Gaussian error with variance one to it and made that little data point, right? And then that's how they made all those little data points. So in this case, they oh. know the error, the random error, the, I see. what do they call okay, the so random error in this thing? Systematic error? No, irreducible. Uh, irreducible. Irreducible, that's it. Error. Right, yeah. right, right. Or is it like you're saying, Ronald, because it's, you know, uh, coming from a normal distribution of average zero and then standard deviation one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Most likely, they don't say that, but that's most likely what they did there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I find in a lot of like stats books, like that I've read now, like recent ones, especially, they do a lot of simulation, but they don't like often reveal what that simulation was. Um, yeah, that would be helpful and, because they don't explain anything as to how they just set that to, to that. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is a shame because actually the simulation approach is very illuminating for mm -hmm. for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if in a later chapter when they actually give you the tools that they actually do start doing some more of that probably, right? I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. All right, um, so yeah, next week we'll do the classification, go into the exercises. Um, if you have time, take a look at these, try to answer them, and then we'll talk about the answers, all right? Great. Okay. Thank you, this is good. Thank Thanks. you, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very Kevin, much, appreciate it. Thank you all. It. Cheers, bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.